Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the museum for hosting me, and I think it's great that the Coca-Cola Company has uh, put some money forward to help this out. Uh, they have really quite a remarkable story to tell uh, as a company and what they're doing, doing worldwide. Uh, it's great for me to be back in Oklahoma City. I'm a big fan of your city. Uh, uh, some people think about Oklahoma, and I think they first think about about uh, football, and that certainly is a, a great tradition here. But I, I love your basketball team, the Thunder. Uh, you know, go Thunder! Uh, just it's, it's such an exciting kind of basketball, and, and the National Basketball Association often isn't all that exciting. Uh, and you've got uh, three teams in the NCAA basketball tournament, although OU did go out yesterday. And, uh, and uh, at the hotel where I am, the Marriott, uh, all these wrestlers are coming in to uh, be here for the NCAA tournament. And I, you just take one look at them and you say, you know, to my, I say to myself, I'm not a wrestler. <laughs> Don't even think about a smart remark, you know. Just <laughs> be a good boy and all will be fine. So, so my task today is to talk about the crisis in the United States. And I, I'll do it in three phases. First, I'd like to describe some of the dimensions because it's, it's, I think, going to be surprising to some of you, even those, those of you who work in the field of water, to see some of the places and some of the problems that we have in the United States. Then I'd like to talk about what we can do about it. There are both some real solutions, but also what I call surreal solutions. And the final thing is a few things we could be doing, but we're not currently doing in the United States. So first, quotation from Ed Abbey, an Arizona writer, a gifted and acerbic writer, Plenty of water in the Mojave Desert, unless you should try to establish a city where no city should be. Well, of course, that would be the city of Las Vegas. So this is the Bellagio Fountain. It's an iconic representation of the city. Uh, it's for some people the reason to go there. It's for other people the reason why they hate it. Uh, it cost $40 million, just a fountain. It holds 27 million gallons of water. It has a footprint of eight acres, and it has 1,200 heads that shoot water as high as 250 feet into the desert sky. But that, that's just the beginning of what's going on in Las Vegas. How many of you know about City Center, which is ongoing? A few people, yeah. This is the largest <clears throat> privately financed construction project in American history. MGM Grand Project, pencils in at $9.1 billion, has six towers, ranging in size from 37 to 61 stories. And to give you a sense of scale, look to the shadow on the far left of that picture. That's the Monte Carlo Casino, one of the largest casinos on the Strip. <clears throat> and it looks like a child's toy compared to these new high rises next to it. At build out, there'll be an additional 50 to 70,000 people living on the Las Vegas Strip, most of them in condominiums, because people from all over the US from Canada, from the EU, from the Pacific Rim, are coming in and chunking, putting down large chunks of, of, of change for condos on the Strip. Las Vegas has, made, has remade itself yet again, because this is not about the gaming industry. It's not about gambling. There's only one casino in the entire operation. Instead, it's about the other kinds of things that Las Vegas offers, the amenities, the nightclubs, the shows, the boutiques, the fine dining and shopping, all of that is what's bringing people to Las Vegas. But there's a problem, and it's a big problem. Las Vegas has run out of water. And uh, Pat Mulroy, until last month, the head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority, was a little late appreciating this. But she had a conversion, and like many religious converts, she's got the faith of water conservation in a way that's quite striking. So among other things that they are doing in Las Vegas is one, they are paying people to rip out lawns, $2 per square foot. And they have spent $200 million doing exactly that. Second thing she's done, she's offered to build the cities of Tijuana and San Diego desalination plants on the Pacific coast. In turn, the city of Las Vegas would take their Colorado River water out of Lake Mead. Third thing she's doing, she wants to embark on a three billion, with a B, billion dollar pipeline to import groundwater from aquifers 250 miles north of the city of Las Vegas in Nevada on the border with Utah. 
But the people up there don't think this is such a hot idea. And if you think about your American history and you think, well, who are the people who live there? They were some of the original pioneers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But now from my perspective as a lawyer who studies fights over water, it couldn't get any better than one that pits Sin City against the Mormons. <laughs> <clears throat> There's one other thing that she's doing, and that is she's running public service announcements to try to encourage people to change their behavior. Uh, now think about whether this might work in your community. To find your watering schedule, go to changeyourclock.com. Well, Las Vegas has a different sense about what's appropriate for television <laughs> than some other communities. All right, well, wait a minute. Uh, let me get this straight. Uh, so she's trying to steal the Mormon's water. She's threatening you with bodily harm. But how can she possibly justify the water use on the Strip, the casinos, the lagoons, and all of those, those uh, illusions of water surplus? Well, actually, pretty easily. Be because when Steve Wynn, the developer of the Bellagio, wanted to build that fountain, he came to her and he said, look at this is my vision for this project. I have to have a water feature. So let me have the water feature, and then tell me what I need to do to satisfy you. And she said, OK, Steve. And she threw the gauntlet down. Are you prepared to double plumb the hotel, to build a reverse osmosis system in the basement, to clean up, clean up the contaminated groundwater, to install instant on hot water, to install low flow fixtures in every feature, to use recycled water in that fountain? And he said yes, and he did, and they all do. And so the stunning thing about Las Vegas' water use on the Strip is it only uses 3% of the city's water, and yet it is the economic driver in the state second to none. In Nevada, as in every western state, farmers use between 70 and 80% of the water. In Nevada, that supports a farming community of about 6,000 jobs. 6,000 jobs is impressive, but it's also only the same number of jobs as a single large casino. So if you start to think about the economic value of water, what you realize is that the Strip is an astonishing cash cow, cash cow for the state of Nevada. So I start with Las Vegas because despite their naughty slogan about what happens there stays there, when it comes to water, what we're looking at is the future. When we look at Las Vegas, we see the future. So what do we have for a problem? Well, the problem says Ben Franklin. <clears throat> When the well's dry, we know the worth of water. Great founding father, wonderful aphorism. But he was wrong. We Americans are spoiled. When we wake up in the morning, we turn on that tap, and out comes as much water as we want for less than we pay for cell phone service or for cable television. When many of us think about water, we think of it as the air, infinite and inexhaustible. When for all practical purposes, it's very finite, and very exhaustible. So just the last few years, some of the things that have been going on, the drought in 2012 in the Midwest, economic losses in excess of 25, closer to $35 billion, commodity prices unheard of levels, $8 corn, $15 soybeans. Anyone who needed corn or soybeans was really, really hurting. And then the next year, suddenly it changed again. Texas, not so lucky. In the western part of Oklahoma, not so lucky. The drought that started in Texas in 2010 shows no sign of letting up. This is a photograph of the Cargill plant, meatpacking plant in Plainview. <clears throat> it closed its doors last year, firing 2,300 workers. The entire population of the town is 22,000. This town is destroyed. Moving to California. This is a photo from last spring of the Sierra, of the high Sierras. You're not supposed to see bare ground in winter in the high Sierra. Snowpack was 17% of normal. It was the driest year in recorded history in California. 
2014 hasn't looked much brighter. The state project for farmers in the Central Valley says they may get no water. Same with the federal project, the Central Valley project. Farmers from those two gigantic Central Valley projects may get no water this year. Predictions are an estimated 500,000 acres of fallow land. This is some of the most productive ag land in the country going fallow. It's uh, truly a scary situation. Lake Mead, which is the supply for Las Vegas, also for Phoenix and Tucson some, and for Southern California cities, this is the bathtub ring. It's, a, it's close to its lowest point since they first, first built uh, uh, Hoover Dam behind Lake, uh, Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam in the 1930s. The Colorado River is in drought for the 14th year. And what's scary is we don't know whether this is the 14th year of a 14-year drought or the 14th year of a 50-year drought. But already the Bureau of Reclamation is telling the states of Arizona and Nevada to expect not to receive their full allotment within two years. Even the Great Lakes, the largest bodies of fresh water, have suffered. In the last few years, the, low, the levels in the lake were so low that cargo ships on Lake Superior, the biggest of them all, couldn't float fully loaded. The depth of the water in the, in the lake was so low. And yet this year, uh, it's come back in a completely different direction. There's ice almost entirely across Lake Michigan, snow banks as high as the ceilings in this room. Even the southeast, the most humid region, has had problems. This is a photograph of Lake Lanier, the principal water supply for Atlanta, metropolitan region of four and a half million people. Four years ago, it came within 60 to 90 days of drying up. It's also, of course, the home for the Coca-Cola company. And the Coca-Cola officials were quite stunned that this was happening in their backyard on their watch. I think it's one of the things that prompted the company to move forward with the aggressive campaign that, that they have. The company uh, recognized what was going on and, and acted proactively. Now you might say, well, of course, water is a big input. You can't have Coca-Cola without water. But the company really has, I think, gone well beyond, beyond that. But the state itself hasn't done much. Oh, to be sure, they passed modest restrictions on washing cars, filling swimming pools, and watering lawns. But beyond that, not anything until the governor got into the act. And the governor said, I have to do something dramatic. And what the governor decided to do was to gather on the, state, on the steps of the state capitol and pray for rain. Now, I have no doubt that prayer is a powerful medium. But I think he checked out the weather site that we just heard about. Because he didn't schedule the prayer vigil until weather forecasters predicted it was going to rain. <laughs> then the state legislature got in the business. And they passed a resolution in 2009 that said that the border with Tennessee, way up at the top there, was said erroneously in a survey. And that the border should be moved one mile north which would just serendipitously bring that little hook in the Tennessee River down into Georgia, where Georgia could insert its straw and suck away to its heart's content. What Georgia did not do, and still has not done, is to put new restrictions on drilling new wells or diverting water from rivers. And to this day, you do not even need a permit to drill a well in Georgia, unless you are going to pump more than 100,000 gallons of water per day, and then you need a permit, and the permit's easy to come by. So I have this simple-minded notion of our water supply as a giant milkshake glass, and I think of each demand for water, each well, as a straw in the glass. And what Georgia and many states permit is a limitless number of straws in the same glass. It's an absolute recipe for disaster. It's so bad in Georgia that the state of Florida just last month sued Georgia in the U.S. Supreme Court. They're concerned not about water for people or for farms. They're concerned about water for the commercial oyster fishing business in Apalachicola Bay. It's a very uh, wonderful place. I actually got to go oystering there a couple of years ago. And that, that rake that they use is about 15 or 17 feet long, and you sort of pull it together, and you. You get mud and, and rocks and 
old shells and hopefully some new oysters, and you sort of muscle it up to the, to the surface. And after about not very long, I had an insight, and that is that I have a really cushy academic job. <laughs> so my favorite in what Georgia was doing or not doing was this. How many of you know about Stone Mountain, a theme park around Atlanta? Um, well, this was Stone Mountain's latest. They decided to create a snow mountain because, as the press release announced, very few Atlanta children had ever had a satisfactory snow experience. That was until this year. So they built Snow Mountain. This is it, outdoors. They brought it online at the end of February, uh, end of September, when the temperature that day was 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And these characters were making snow outdoors. We humans have an infinite capacity to deny reality. And so this is the reality, the hydro-illogical cycle. Drought makes you aware, it leads to concern, eventually you panic, but then it rains. And it's back to business as usual. And I'm sorry to say that's pretty much what's happened in Georgia. Not much. Oh, there's a plan. Not much in the plan. Now you might say, but listen, a drought by definition is an aberrant level of precipitation. That's the whole definition of a drought. But the problem is that the hydrologists who studied that drought said there was nothing different about this drought than earlier droughts. Well, then why were the consequences so much more dramatic? One reason, population growth. Population growth, growth is the elephant in the room of environmental challenges. You can't name another environmental, any environmental challenge where when you scratch the surface, doesn't come back to population growth. Atlanta adds about 100,000 people per day, I mean per a year. Uh, California, one person per minute is the growth rate there. We nudged over 300 million in the U.S. population-wise about four years ago, and yet the Census Bureau predicts that by 2060, we are going to hit 420 million citizens. 2060, that's in the lifetime of many of you in the room. Well, at least some of you in the room, so. So 420 million people is a lot of people to come up with water and food and other resources for. So really, when we talk about water, what we're talking about is a supply and a demand, and they're not connected. So the demand, the demand comes in a lot of different ways. This is one of my favorite. This is Kohler's power shower. It has 10 shower heads, each with the force, enough water pressure to take paint off walls. They're very popular in Phoenix, which is why we in Tucson look down our noses on people in Phoenix. Uh, this is uh, Jennifer Aniston pimping for the Glasso Smart Water. Um, I was the first to point the finger at bottled water about 10 years ago in my book Water Follies, especially about spring water, because it just hammers springs. But imagine being Coca-Cola when this craze of bottled water took off, right? They've got this secret formula, it's the world's most popular drink, and someone comes along and says, I have a better idea. I'm just gonna put water in a bottle, forget the syrup. And people pay more money for water in a bottle than for Coke. Right? It just doesn't compute. Well, at this point, a few years later, you know the drill. It's a thousand times more expensive than tap. It's no better than tap. It does serve certain conveniences when you're traveling and the like. Um, but rather than go into that litany, instead I will say to you, if you have not seen the Penn and Teller skit on bottled water, check it out on YouTube. So it shows a fancy California restaurant, but instead of a Wine steward, there's a wa uh, instead of a water steward, sorry, instead of a wine steward, there's a water steward. And instead of a wine list, there's a water list. And they're presenting it to the patrons, and the patrons are looking it over, and the, the guy with the apron saying, definitely Arctic flavors. And they're swirling the, the water around like it, was a, like it was a French wine, right? And then the clip goes to the backyard where Penn is filling all these bottles out of the garden hose. <laughs> 
Okay, so there are some indulgent uses, you know, these crazy showers with 10 shower heads and bottled water. But there are also real, there's real demand for water that's critical to our well-being as a people. And one of those is for energy. And one of these demands is for ethanol. Now, I'm sorry to say that there is almost no connection between U.S. energy policy and the water implications of those policies. And ethanol is a wonderful example. And ethanol is controversial for a number of reasons. I don't have a dog in that fight. Instead, I'm stunned at the water use. Even in a plant that recycles its water, it takes four gallons of water to refine one gallon of ethanol. And Congress has suggested that in the next 10 years, we should produce 36 billion gallons of biofuels. That's a big amount, but it's not too bad if you're in the heartland where, except for the drought in 2012, Mother Nature generally provides enough water for, for for uh, dry land farming. But if you look at a lot of the dots out west, those are places where you have to irrigate. And corn is a very consumptive crop. It can take as much as 2,500 gallons of water to, ref to grow enough corn to refine one gallon of ethanol. Well, now when you do the math, it's really quite, quite stunning. Uh, a new player on the stage of the energy issue is fracking. Uh, fracking itself actually each well doesn't take all that much water. The problem that fracking faces is that in a lot of the good places to frack, the places already are stressed for water. So this is a new demand on a, on a region that's already very stressed. The point I'd like to make here is twofold. One, water is not simply an environmental amenity. It's, it's important as an input in virtually every Fortune 500 company. And I'm not just talking about the Coca-Colas or the, the Kellogg's for cereals and grain production. I'm talking about Intel, huge need for water. Google, this is a Google facility. It's a server farm. Yeah, they've got that, that algorithm that runs all of the searches. But every time you click that button on your computer or take that photograph or send a text or do whatever, that is data that needs to get stored, and it's being stored in these data centers. And the inside of this is, is, uh, is, has uh, literally tens of thousands of the innards of computers all on, on, on staging, and it's generating enormous amounts of heat. And Google and the other people that have cloud operations need to dissipate that heat in order to make the machines run. There's something like two million minutes of video, two million minutes, two, two million, what's the number? I'm forgetting the number. It's just it's a huge amount of data that people are sending back and forth. And I have to tell you, your cat isn't that interesting. You know? <laughs> but, but, but people want to know right now, like how many friends does Justin Bieber still have? And if you don't have it nine, in six nines time, oh, the world has come to an end. And these server farms are so inefficient, but everyone who has a website wants to make sure if at two in the morning someone has insomnia that they can find out how many friends Justin Bieber has, or they can order a floral arrangement from your florist shop. And this is a huge new demand. Two to three percent of the entire supply of energy in the United States is, is just for server farms. So water is needed for energy, and energy is needed for water. 20% of all of the electricity in California is just moving pieces of water around and treating it, 20%. So that's a new demand, because we in the United States have a national interest in ensuring that companies like Google and Facebook and Apple and Intel have as much water as they want so that they can continue to provide high-paying jobs located in the United States rather than in other choices that they may have. So what are we going to do about this? There's a disconnect between supply and demand. Well, one of the things that the Midwest is afraid we want to do about this is those of us in the West come and steal their water. And this is an actual billboard from the state of Michigan. I taught back in Michigan some time ago. And whenever I'm back there, which is pretty frequently, I put this, this photo up and I say, you should be ashamed of yourselves. 
This is a scurrilous attack on those of us in the West. We have no interest in diverting all of the Great Lakes. Frankly, we'd be happy with one of the smaller ones. So, <laughs> so there are these idiotic proposals to move water great distances. This is my favorite real one, which is a guy out of Colorado who wants to take water from Flaming Gorge Reservoir across the I-80 corridor down to Denver and all the way down to Colorado Springs. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the regulatory obstacles and other obstacles that Mr. Millian faces before he gets his permit, but I will mention one, and that's something called the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> so these harebrained ideas of towing icebergs from the Arctic or diverting a river from British Columbia are nonsense, and we need to put them to one side. We have solutions, but that is not a solution. Nor, frankly, is business as usual. And business as usual means one of three things. Diverting more water from rivers, but frankly, so many of our rivers are already stressed that that's just not viable. And I'm not talking about little streams. I'm talking about the Rio Grande or the Colorado in, in the southwest that doesn't reach the ocean anymore because we have completely dried it up. So more diversions really isn't going to get the job done. We can build more dams. We've been very good at that. But the reality is that all the good places for dams have dams on them. Now, neighboring Texas recently passed an initiative to build a whole bunch of new reservoirs. Texas, frankly, will do anything other than look itself in the mirror and be honest with itself. I mean, they tried to steal your water. The Supreme Court slapped them around. Um, but they haven't ended. We're going to build more reservoirs. I mean, if Dallas just stopped watering lawns, you know, that'd be a really good step forward. The third option is groundwater pumping, and we heard of the Ogallala Aquifer earlier. We have really uh, taken advantage of this easy, unregulated access to groundwater. And across the country, you're seeing the result plummeting water tables, and that has enormous implications. Ultimately, it's the farmers who get hurt because there's a point at which you just simply can't afford to pay the energy to pump the water up that much. And meanwhile, you get, you get incredible environmental problems. Here's a, 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 a fisher from Queen Creek outside of Phoenix from two years ago from excessive groundwater pumping. This is a sinkhole from Florida. You saw this in the news earlier last year. A guy went to bed and he did his, right, the, the house disappeared. They still haven't found the poor guy, right, from excessive groundwater pumping. Uh, check this out. At the top is the year 1925, and at the bottom, by his feet, is 1977. That's how much the land surface has dropped in the San Joaquin Valley from excessive groundwater pumping. And what's happening today as we sit here this morning in California new wells are being drilled because when the feds and the states cut off water from the surface, they're drilling new wells. The system is completely unregulated, absolutely insane. <clears throat> um, then there's the problem of what happens to the, to the rivers and springs because, of course, water from the ground is supplying water to the surface. The river is always the low point in the basin and it's receiving water subsurface as it moves laterally. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, and I was shocked to find this out. This is a river, river just outside of Boston, a before and after photo. This isn't Arizona where I live now. We see this all the time. This is a state that gets more rain than Seattle, and yet excessive groundwater pumping has dried the river up in five of the last eight years. So business as usual is not going to get the job done. We cannot continue to have these crazy ideas of bringing water over mountains or from foreign countries and drilling new wells and building new dams. The, the reality is that that era is over. In fact, for dams, we're taking dams out, not building them. From the Penobscot in Maine to the Klamath in Oregon, dams are being removed. Thousands of miles of free-flowing rivers have been restored as a result of this. So we need to think about other ways to proceed. And there are some other things we can think about. Um, Mark Twain, everyone complains about the weather. Well, some people think that we should modify the weather, weather modification or cloud seeding. 
The idea is you take a little silver iodide and you, you, and you shoot it up into the air and then you hope that it, it rains. I just ask you as sensible people, do you want your water supply to depend on these two characters? <laughs> I didn't think so. So that's another stupid harebrained idea. The scientists say, all right, it rained. How do you know it rained because you shot this thing up in the air? Maybe it was going to rain anyway. Uh, but people are so desperate not to have to change their behavior that they'll do things like cloud, cloud seeding. Well, how about desalination? Well, now, now we've got something we can be serious about. Because desalination is a technology that we have. We can take the salt out of water. We can make potable water out of ocean water. But it's not a panacea. It's really expensive. The membranes that we use are extremely costly. They're prone to fouling. They require frequent replacement. Second, it's a huge energy sink because it's all done under high pressure. And so that reinforces the energy water connection. And then third, what do you do with the salt that's left over? Because that doesn't go away. You have to figure out something to do with it. Now, ideally, if you were on the coast of California, you could have a 10-mile trough uh, out into the Pacific trough, and the currents would just dissipate it. But that would be a 20-year regulatory process and cost billions and billions of dollars. What people want to do is dump the water in close to shore. But the problem there is, of course, you have estuaries in sensitive conditions, nursery conditions for saltwater creatures that would be hammered if you suddenly put a whole bunch of super saline water in there. Still, desal is one of the things in the portfolio. And if you have a high value use, few other options, desal will be part of, uh, of, of, of a solution. What else can we do? Well, we can, we can reuse water. Now, if this gets to be some pushback from, from journalists. It's sometimes been dubbed the toilet to tap proposal. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not asking you to elbow the dog out of the way. That's not, that's not what I'm here for this morning. What I am here to say is that we in Tucson, we use reclaimed water for all kinds of things, not direct potable use. We're not drinking it. But golf courses around Tucson, almost all of them now are on reclaimed water. We use it for cemeteries, parks, highway medians, light, in, light industrial applications. Uh, Google's starting to use reclaimed water for its server farms. So this is a really terrific option, reuse of municipal effluent. And best of all, it's a, it's a, a, a quantity that grows as the community grows. It's not a panacea. It's quite expensive. It requires a separate set of pipes because it's not treated water, or not treated as much, I should say. And so you need to have a separate set system of pipes that's easy to put in in a newly, uh, new suburb or a new area of town rather than uh, digging up streets in the central business district. Still, it's a wonderful opportunity that we're not taking advantage of, reusing municipal effluent. And the third thing is conservation. Now, I have high regard for Senator Feinstein. Uh, this must be one of the most stupid things the senator ever said. God-given right. Well, um, California, Southern California, the cities of Las, uh, of Los Angeles and San Diego, they get about 13 inches of rain a year. We in Tucson, in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, get about 12 inches of rain a year. They just act as though they were in a, a temperate zone and they have lush landscapes and roses and azaleas and whatnot. If they just took a look at their landscape use, Southern California would go a long way towards solving their water crisis. So conservation. And we heard this morning, and do go over and check out the water harvesting system there. Uh, this has become very big in Tucson. A lot of uh, West Texas folks are putting in water harvesting uh, uh, systems. This particular photograph, comes from the state of Washington, from San Juan Island. A couple there, because they're on an island, they have a four-month rainy season and nothing after that. So this silo captures enough water from the rain that hits their roof to be 
uh, to provide a supply for them for the entire year. So they're off the water grid simply by having the cistern. And then they run an RO system through it and a, a light that makes sure there's no contamination or, or bacteria, and they have a supply of water. So that's, that's a, a conservation. It remains the low-hanging fruit. But now I have to be sober and somber for a moment because there are places that are already desalinating, already reusing municipal effluent, and they already have aggressive conservation programs. So what are they going to do? Well, there are three things I'd like to talk with you about in the, in the few minutes I have left. Three things that we could be doing but aren't doing in the United States. First, I want to take dead aim at the flush toilet. The flush toilet is one of the craziest things ever. Now, in the 19th century, when that was developed, it was seen as an advance in public health. But today, it's way past that. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt, a century ago, said that civilized people should do something with sewage other than put it in the drinking water. Well, of course. Oh, no, wait. No, that's what we do, right? We get delivered drinking quality water to our homes, and we urinate and defecate in it. And then we send it back to them to do it all over again. It's like Lucy and Charlie Brown and the football. She keeps pulling the football away. And that's what we do to these poor people. They treat up our mess. And what do we say? Thank you. Let me shit in it again. You know? it's, if you think about the flush toilet for more than a nanosecond, you realize it's a system that wastes water, wastes money, wastes energy, and it may compromise human health because there are, from the things that we get from the pharmacist, compounds that are very powerful, antibiotics and hormone supplements and, and everything else that comes in a little brown bottle. The EPA calls them emerging contaminants. The issue is whether they contain endocrine-disrupting compounds that change our, the way our bodies work. And the truth is they do. And traditional wastewater treatment plants do not remove those residues. And the people who have studied the, the water downstream of treatment plants are finding deformed fish, intersex frogs, kind of scary stuff. Uh, I tell in the book one story about an upscale Connecticut community that tested its water supply. And it really is a kind of community-wide urinalysis. Like, what are your neighbors taking, legal or illegal? So you take the pill, your body absorbs some of it, you excrete the rest, you flush it away, it goes down to the treatment plant and it's not removed. And this Connecticut town found that cocaine and ecstasy use spiked on the weekends. Now, now I don't care if you want to get high, but I don't want to be drinking the residue of the fun you had over the weekend. Now, I don't want to be the sky is falling kind of guy, because these are microscopic doses measured in the parts per trillion. But that said, we do not know, and EPA does not know, and they have tried, to figure out what's the safe maximum exposure level to any one of these compounds. Never mind the veritable cocktail mix, because it depends on what a couple of hundred people are taking. So now is the time, I think, to take a fresh look at the flush toilet. The treatment plants that the feds built under the Clean Water Act in the 70s are now coming to the end of their useful lives. It's time to have a national commission to explore waterless ways to deal with human waste. I mean, already we have waterless urinals. They're all around the University of Arizona campus. There are composting and incinerating toilets. Whether they're ready for prime time, I don't know. What I know is that we have the ingenuity and the creativity. We have the, 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 the imagination if we as Americans put our, 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 our effort into it to come up with something else. Now, there are people who really like flush toilets, and I appreciate that. OK, second, we got to talk about the price of water. I want you to pay for water, OK? Flat out simple. There it is, stated it. Now you say, well, I'm already paying for water, and I'm paying too much. Oh, yeah? How much are you paying? Uh, I don't remember. Right, you're not paying enough. And, and even if you did remember, you're still not paying for water. All you're paying for is the cost of service. You're paying for the utility to have 
water that it has pumped or treated and puts in pipes and has built the system and has a treatment plant and delivers it to you, that's what you're paying for, the cost of service. There's no, no charge for the water itself. And this past year or two in Texas, that's created enormous problems for Texas cities. Because what the Texas cities have done, hundreds of them, was slap really severe water conservation rules on their citizens. The citizens obeyed. They used less water. Because they used less water, the local utility, either the public water department or a public utility regulated by the state public utility commission, suddenly they didn't have enough money. There was a revenue shortage. So what do the towns have to do? They have to raise the rates, right? Well, that's not a political message that's very palatable, right? Please conserve. Thank you for conserving. Here's the bill, right? So let's just, as adults, have a conversation about pricing water. Now, I think this is how it should go. First, a human right to water is something we should recognize. If the richest country in the history of the world can't do that, we're a sorry lot. Truth is, it's not a lot of water. It's about 1% of the water that we use nationwide, 10 or 15 gallons per person per day. That's 1%. So let's just do that because it's the right thing to do. Then we can have an adult discussion. And what it should be is not no meters or no charges, which some communities have. You use as much as you want for nothing. It should be instead increasing block rates seasonally adjusted because people are using more water in the summer not because they're taking more baths or cooking more meals, but they're growing things outside or they're filling a swimming pool. If you want a swimming pool, fine, but you should have to pay for it. Now, I get a lot of pushback on this one, too. And whenever I'm on the stage with an elected official and I start talking about pricing water, we're looking for the escape route. You know, and Where's my chief of staff? Who put me on this? What? I had no idea this guy was that crazy. Pricing water? I mean. That's a, that's a proverbial, you know, assurance of term limits, you know. I want to raise your water rates. But, you know, I don't care about that. And the reason why I don't care is because I have tenure. <laughs> okay, third, last thing. It's water reallocation. So we're back to the basic concept which is that that's the water supply. And there are some new high value uses, Google, Intel, and the like, for water. And we need to make sure they have water. So how do we do that? So the way that we do that is through what happened in, in Utah. And this story is about Geneva Steel, a steel company that was built by the US government during the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, they spun it off to U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel ran it for several generations. After several generations, though, by the end of the 20th century, the U.S. Steel industry was on the ropes. Uh, Pittsburgh had 100-year-old blast furnaces. Uh, Detroit was making automobiles that people didn't seem to want to buy. The Chinese steel industry is young and aggressive and taking market share. So Geneva Steel tries to reorganize. That doesn't work. They file for bankruptcy. That doesn't work. So eventually, they have to liquidate their assets. But fortunately, they had substantial assets to liquidate. So the land, this was just outside of Provo, Utah, where Brigham Young University is. Land brought in 46 million. The mill they sold to a Chinese firm for 40. An iron ore mine brought in 10. Pollution reduction credits, four. All told, they netted $100 million. And then? They sold the water rights. Yeah, wow. The water rights were worth more than all of these other very substantial assets combined. This is the future of water in the United States, as it should be. What happened in Utah was that the state engineer said, I'm not playing this game of charades anymore. No more wink, wink, nod, nod, and I give you a permit to divert water from a river when I know that the river is fully appropriated, and if you do that, the fish are going to get hammered and the environment just devastated. Not going to do that. Same thing with groundwater pumping. The, ground, the, the water table's already dropping. I'm not going to give you a new a permit for a new well. But it's not no growth. It's demand offset. It's saying, 
If you want to put a new straw in the glass, you must persuade someone else to take her straw out of the glass. Then I'll give you your permit. And that's what's going on across the American West. I just finished a, a, a project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation with two economists. And we looked at water marketing, sales and leases of water across the West. And it's a fairly robust market. Uh, it's over a 25-year period, 3,200 sales and leases of water, uh, 30 million acre feet of water traded. That's twice the annual flow of the Colorado River, uh, our Colorado River further west. So a lot of sales and leases. And I was wondering, well, what is this going to do to farmers? Because the water is going to come out of farming. It's not going to come from steel companies. What we're talking about is farmers making do with somewhat less water because farmers use 70 or 80 percent of the water. So that's something that we need to be very careful about how we move forward. But there's some good news in this. And the good news is a 5 percent reduction in ag water use almost doubles the municipal supply. 5 percent doubles the municipal supply. And what we found in the study was really fairly counterintuitive. What we found is that most trades were farmer to farmer. If the price of broccoli spikes, the broccoli grower buys some more water from someone else in his irrigation district. But most of the water was moving from agriculture into municipal, industrial, and environmental. And we found that despite that, farm income held constant for inflation did not go down. Well, now how can that be? Well, several things happened. One, a farmer, when offered a deal by a developer, can say, no, I don't want your money. I want to keep my water. Second, the farmer can say, you know, that land up by the barn, it's, it's all clay soil. It's got a relatively low yield of bushels per acre. Let's fallow it. Third thing farmers are doing is they're saying, yeah, that 700,000, OK, well, I could, I could uh, line the ditch. I could put in some center pivots with that money. I can grow the same product with more efficient irrigation systems paid for by someone else. And that's what's one thing that's going on. And the final thing that's going on is changing crop mix. This photograph is from Yuma, Arizona. It's the classic illustration of farm workers harvesting iceberg lettuce. And I have to tell you, it's a a heck of a way and a tough way to make a living. It takes a score of workers the better part of a day. And that iceberg head that you buy at the market doesn't come like that. In the field, it's got all of these leaves sticking out from it. And those leaves need to be macheted away before the worker puts the head into the box. So another way of thinking about this photograph is the whole foreground is really wasted water. It's water that was used to grow leaves of lettuce that have no economic value. And so they are left to desiccate in the, in the desert, under the desert sun. And so what some farmers are doing is they're moving toward baby lettuce. <clears throat> and this has become the rage the last 10 years. You've seen this incredible, out, uh, huge uh, increase in baby lettuces. All kinds of baby lettuces, too. Dicchio and arugula. And Dandelion leaves, I mean, all, you know, all kinds of wild stuff. Have you noticed the price you're paying for those boxes of baby lettuces? Yeah, so the farmers. Eight bucks for a box of lettuce. And so what the farmers are doing is putting in these, and this is how they cultivate it. On the left is your basic tractor trailer rig. Two guys, a guy driving and a guy getting the boxes. And on the right, it's, it's like a gigantic electric razor. It's cutting off the, the the little tender, bed, little tender baby lettuce leaves just above the, 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 the ground level. It's going up the conveyor belt. They're falling into a box, and then they're moved sideways into the box. When they finish, this is what the row looks like. It takes four guys a couple of hours to do the entire field, and then the field goes off to market. So at the end of the day, I'm optimistic. What we've done with water is treated no better than we did the buffalo in the 19th century. But what I've tried to do this morning is to say there's no reason to despair. The crisis is real. We have no doubt about that. 
And there are some silly solutions, surreal solutions out there. But also, conservation will work. Reuse will work. Uh, desalination will work. And so, too, should we use price signals to encourage conservation and market forces to encourage the reallocation of water. And if we do these things together, we can fix it. And so the crisis, I think, is a time of opportunity. And if we act, then we, keep, can we, can, then we can keep the crisis from becoming a catastrophe. And so now what we need, what we really need, is the moral courage and the political will to act. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We've got time for a few questions. Do we have any in the audience? Let me start right back here. If we don't have time to go through all the questions, I'm going to be around until about 3 o'clock this afternoon, so 2.30. So be happy to chat with you over lunch and I'm going to be signing some books, and so I'll be around for a few more hours. You spent quite a bit of time talking about the metropolitan areas and the industries using recycled water and lake water and fighting over that. What do you foresee on the future for the aquifers for rural people like myself who rely on well water? I think it depends, sir, on which state you're in and whether there are any regulations that keep you and your fellow farmers from drawing down the aquifer too low. Um, in Arizona, we passed a very progressive Groundwater Management Act in 1980. And I use that word progressive advisedly because you don't usually find the words Arizona and progressive in the same sentence. <laughs> but this act, what this act did was it said instead of Instead of anyone who wants being able to drop a new straw into the glass, all those who are currently invested in it and have made the commitment to use the water are grandfathered in. And then all of those people over time are going to be ratcheted slightly back so that we stop the decline in the water table and we achieve some sort of safe yield. Uh, and then the third part is a ban on new wells being drilled with very limited exceptions. But the, for those who need new water, the rights that are, the existing rights are transferable. So you can, you have a kind of demand offset system that I was describing. This was actually happening in Texas with the Edwards Aquifer Authority, but two very recent uh, uh, Texas appellate court decisions have made it seem as though that, that may be unconstitutional under the takings clause. Let me, let me spend a minute more on that. So there are some people who say, well, it's my property. I have a right to drill a well. Well, the, that sounds at the surface level alluring, but every first year law student when she takes property finds that property is a set of characteristics. And one of the basic characteristics is the exclusion. It's your property, not mine. So I, you can kick me off your property. But if the rule is anyone who wants gets to drill a well, that's not a property right. That's really a, kind of a circular firing squad. Everyone together hold hands and we jump off the cliff because it creates an incentive to drill wells as often as you can and to pump as much water as you want because if you don't, your neighbor may. So we need to set limits, sharp limits, for groundwater pumping. And I think the way to do it is to protect the existing user group and put limits on new pumping. I can just imagine the Facebook conversations that some of the people that I communicate with could have upon listening to something like this. But uh, I have an uncle that used to be in the... Uh, consulting engineering business and he would develop water supplies and I believe he came up with the first land application system in Oklahoma for for wastewater but here a few years ago we used to say I have good news and bad news well what's that And he said well in so many years we're going to be drinking our own wastewater and uh, well what's the what's the bad news bad news there isn't going to be enough of it to go around <laughs> and and on seeing your your presentation and and when you brought up the, the issue of, of, uh, 
of drinking recycled wastewater. Uh, you talked about contaminants in the water and the endocrine functions and that kind of thing. And and we, I think we, what I'm really trying to say is we need to start thinking. We cannot get hung up in linear thinking. We cannot automatically think, well, since we have wastewater, we're going to automatically be, have this problem. And also, if we've got those problems in our wastewater, we need to start thinking about if we're using too many antibiotics, we need to start changing the way we live. And that's, that's going to be hard to do, especially in this day and time in our political polarization we have with Republicans and Democrats and Libertarians and, and whatever. So that's, that's the main thing I want to say is we, we, you know, we need to start asking some more questions. Why, why do our vegetables have to be uh, raised in the, the California Valley or Oregon? Why can they not be raised someplace else? Why, why does all the corn have to be raised in, in Nebraska with irrigation that is? Why, why does that have to happen? Why can we not have another paradigm? To, to feed ourselves. Yeah. So that's so, that's the one thing yeah, that I want to say. Great, great comments, sir. Thank you very much for all of them. Um, uh, d two quick comments. On the last one, on the Nebraska corn or any other crop, often it's because the farmer, the individual farmer has no right to do something else with the water but grow the crop in that place with that amount. If they don't use the water, they may lose the right to the water. Well, that's crazy, right? I mean, if you can figure out a way to be more efficient, you should, you should make a profit from doing that. And if you want to use it to grow more, more of whatever you're growing on another field that you've got, fine. Or if you want to take the offer of this developer and sell the developer some of the water you've conserved, fine. But there should be incentives to be efficient, not uh, incentives to use water because there's nothing else to do with it. Uh, the second. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. It's a stupid rule. So, so and I want to go back to your uncle. Um, that, that relates to my point about price. Because as I go around, I meet inventors and engineers who have built better water mousetraps, things that work. And it is so sad because almost to a person, none of them has a viable business plan. Because the price of water is so low that it's not worth buying their invention to save water. Price, the price point is really a critical one. One last question before we break to lunch. Oh, then I better answer short. If I'm the only thing between you and lunch, okay. Okay, one word answer, sir. No, no. Are there any countries around the world that we can look to for examples for conserving water? Yeah, actually, Australia. I was in sabbatical, on sabbatical in Australia, New Zealand last year, and was, Australia's got a very aggressive program to not only protect the environment, but, but have the urban sector pay uh, for the modernization of some, some farm irrigation systems. I think they've got a pretty good system. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. Okay, well, this Let's has been a real pleasure. Thanks for hosting me. Look yes. forward to chatting with you. Thank you, you one more time. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>